Okay, so if you follow my band Failure on social media, you may have seen recently that we announced a vinyl box set of our first three albums. We are calling it Failure 1992 through 1996 because that was the time frame that these albums were originally released and we weren't feeling especially creative when we titled it. The reason we are doing this now is because we finally got access to the original tapes, which for me has been a pretty incredible thing to go back and really hear what we did musically back then as a band, but also on Fantastic Planet, what I got to do on my first project as the recording and mixing engineer. My name is Ken Andrews and welcome to episode five. The Failure Tapes. Okay, quick answer to the question about the music in my intro. That is actually an instrumental mix of a failure song called Distorted Fields from our most recent album. Check the links in the description for how to get your hands on that if you like. So ever since we took the production and mixing reins on our third album, Fantastic Planet, in 1995, I have personally really wanted to go back and remix the first two albums, Comfort and Magnified, to bring them more sonically into line with Fantastic Planet and also our two newest albums. Now, I realize for some people that might be kind of a questionable thing to do, but I think it makes sense for failure because recording and mixing our own stuff has become part of the ethos of the band. Another reason we wanted to do this has been the disappointment with the reissues of the first two albums, which have not been up to our standards for quality. As an artist, it's kind of difficult to let inferior versions of your work let sit out there in the wild, so... This was also an opportunity to kind of set the record straight for us as well. So what does the process of restoring these albums actually entail? Well, the first thing that has to be done is transferring all the original tapes to digital. It's simply not a good idea to play the analog tapes any more than required to transfer them as they are pretty old now and each play can potentially result in oxide shedding off the tapes. So here's some footage I grabbed of the transfer process that we did at LAFX. This is Bill Smith, the transfer engineer. Comfort and Magnified were recorded to two inch analog 24 track. So we used a good old Studer deck to transfer everything into Pro Tools at 24 bit 96K. While we don't have plans to remix Fantastic Planet, I did want to take the opportunity to get the multi-tracks transferred off the original ADAT tapes. ADAT was an early digital format that was coming online right around 94, 95 when we were planning the recording of Fantastic Planet. It was a bit of a breakthrough at the time because it was the first time where a decent sounding 24 track recorder cost under $10,000. The ADAT machines were modular as in each one handled eight tracks and you could sync multiple units together. We ended up owning five ADAT machines because two were always in the shop for repairs. Nonetheless, I actually think they sounded pretty darn good for the time despite being fixed at 16 bit 48K. I believe we had about eight channels of high quality external mic amps, a couple decent compressors, and one Eventide H3000 for effects. All monitoring and rough mixes were done through a Mackie 32 by eight mixer, with the idea being that we would go to a proper mix studio in town when we were ready to mix. We did make quite a few rough mixes of everything before we were ready to call it done. We ended up in a studio in Silver Lake called Mad Hatter. I believe we mixed about five or six songs there, but then we started to question if we were really getting what we wanted there and took a break. What happened is we ended up listening to some roughs I had done before we moved to Mad Hatter on the Mackie 32 by 8 and they had some kind of mojo that we just didn't feel we were getting on the Neve. I know that seems counterintuitive. The Neve probably cost 300000 and the Mackie cost 3000 But I think what was really happening is that when I was mixing the roughs, I was being really bold and decisive because I knew they wouldn't be used. So we decided to move back to our project studio rental house and try and mix it there. So we rented four 1176s, four DBX 160s, an SSL bus compressor, and a Studer half-inch machine. Still much cheaper than the day rate for a proper mix room. But now, the pressure was on. Me. I really needed something to click, and fortunately it did. 
There was just something about the familiarity and small footprint of that board that allowed me to really just have fun and get into it. Then at the very end of mix selection, Greg suggested we do a final listen back to the Mad Hatter mixes for a comparison. And lo and behold, we actually ended up preferring four of the Mad Hatter mixes. Saturday Savior, Pillowhead, Another Space Song, and The Nurse Who Loved Me. And so those were used on the album with everything else being mixed at what we had begun to call Fantastic Planet Studios by then. So today I thought I would just pull up one multi-track session from Fantastic Planet and let you see exactly how we made it using the technology of 1995. I've selected the song Heliotropic because I know there are many people who are interested in the production for that song, especially the distorted bass sound. So what I'd like to do for you is just take the raw session and just do a very quick down and dirty mix using just one channel strip plugin on each channel. I think this will give you a nice look at each individual track and maybe give you some basic ideas for how to get a rough mix together quickly. All right, let's dive in. Here's the session. All I've really done is named the tracks. I've gone ahead and already instantiated the uh, Waves SSL G channel strip on all the channels. I still kind of gravitate towards the channel strip workflow where you can just quickly shape a sound into uh, something usable really fast. And I especially like the G channel on drums because of its uh, expander and gate section here. So let's see, we've got the first track here is Kick Drum. Uh, not exactly a huge sounding kick drum. Um, there's a lot of other drum tracks to come, so let's just quickly get this into shape. Um, one thing I love about this channel strip is it already has this low mid uh, 500 selected with a fairly sharp cue, and on kick drums, Generally, if you cut out some of that, when you have kind of a thinner sounding drum, maybe just add a little bit of low, a little 50, 60. Well, let's see what we can do with uh, the gate. Or It's actually set to expansion right now. When this isn't lit, it's expanding. So let's just crank the range up. Turn the attack up to quick. Set the release. You know, somewhere around there, 90, 100, and then see how much of the snare we can get rid of here without affecting the attack of the, the kick too much. Let's turn this up until it's kind of adversely affecting the, the attack of the kick drum there. Now it's coming back. compress our kick drum just a little bit here usually what I do is just crank the threshold all the way up and slowly roll in some the ratio until I see it working just a little bit I don't want to over compress the kick at this stage all right so there's our track and now that's what we have there's our kick. Let's see what's happening with the snare. Now I have a preset that I've made that just has like the a basic um, expansion and compression setting. I just call it drum start. And right off the bat, it's doing pretty much what I want in terms of compression and expansion. And Maybe just a little bit more compression. So we got rack tom here. What's happening with the rack tom? Actually, the isolation is really good. That's actually not bad at all. Let's put our drum start, see what happens. Slow the release down a little bit. That's a nice chunky tom sound. I like that. I'm going to pan it over to the left a little bit. Maybe knock out some 500. Not too much. And maybe knock out a little bit of a uh, low end. Let's hear it again. There's 
Maybe you can press a little harder. The attack coming out there. Not bad. I'm just going to copy that plug-in setting and paste it down to the floor tom. This is a place to start. Uh, but let's see how that rack tom is balancing against the... Um... Now we've got floor tom. Also, not a bad sound. Not as hard hit. So I'm going to just bring the whole clip up a little bit. Make sure those hits crack the gate every time. Now, what I would actually do at this point, if I was um, not going for a quick mix, is I would probably go in here, at least on this four tom track, and actually edit out everything except the hits. Uh, rather than trying to find a, a, a gate setting that is probably going to be a compromise between cutting out noise and um, losing a bit of attack on the on the tom hit. But for now, I'm just going to go with the gated sound and kind of live with that. Okay, let's just listen to that all together. We've got close kick, snare, and toms. Let's look at ride symbol. This is all hi-hat, and then here it comes. Maybe. Yeah, there's the ride symbol. So we're gonna pan it off to where the ride would be. Maybe over here. Uh, kinda like the ride sound, because it's not too bright. I'm gonna just roll off a little bit of low end. Listen to it down here. Might take out some 500. I'll replace it with these other tracks. And let's check out the hi-hat. Panning it off a little bit. Quite a bit of toms on there, but... We'll just leave that. And keep in mind, this is just the close mics. I'm just getting like a real basic balance here. Now, so the ride is on the wrong side here. Again, we were into audience perspective back then, but we're gonna change that today. The drummer's perspective with the ride on the right side and then we've got crash basically we'll be using this overhead track for crashes because they're the loudest thing in there right symbols are going to be in the stereo room mics which is coming up next so we're going to be getting a lot of symbol from those as well Let's reverse those. That's the natural drum sound that we recorded, but we wanted a very affected, sort of hyper distorted drum sound for this. So there's these two other tracks here called Distorted Drum Mix and Drum Kit Effects. It's very distorted. It's a little hard to tell if it was sourced from a drum machine or from this drum kit. It's not sure, but there's definitely a machine hi-hat here on the right. <laughs> but And that tom sounds real to me, and it looks like, yeah, that tom is real, and it is sourced from the real rack tom track because look at these waveforms they actually totally match up so weird okay so it's basically some sort of combination of drum machine and uh live kit mixed together into this drum distorted mix and i'm blending it in now with our natural kit mix
Now there's another track of drum effects. I just call it drum kit effects. Let's check that out. Whoa. Definitely some flanging and some reverb happening. Sounds like this is a, a mix of the drum kit uh, sent to some kind of flange reverb patch, probably on the Eventide uh, H3000. Oh yeah, now it's coming together. Oh, let's see. <laughs> there's a mistake on this drum print. The direct floor tom is missing from this mix. I'm hearing just the reverb return of it. But I am hearing the rack tom, so that was a mistake. That, it made it onto the record. But at least this one has it. That sounds like drum machine tom to me. I'm thinking this whole distorted drum mix right here was like we programmed the whole song, the pattern of the drums with the drum machine, then played on top of it and kind of blended it all together. And now all we get to what I know a lot of people have been waiting for is the bass. And there's one track of bass. In fact, if you just look at this, we've got, what, something like 10 or 12 drums and percussion tracks. And then after that, we have a bass guitar track. There's no DI versus amp. We have a bowed upright bass. Just two tracks of guitar, mono each. One track of synth pad, one lead vocal track, and one affected lead vocal track. Same performance. So there's really not that many tracks going on here. But let's check out the bass. To me, that sounds like an amp may not even be involved. Interestingly, though, I'm hearing bleed. I'm hearing cymbal bleed on this track. Yeah, it takes a low end boost very nicely. Let's look at this bowed upright bass. It only appears in a few spots in the song, but let's hear what it's doing. Ah, yes. Ah, it's a loop. So is that something we played? I think so, because we had a, an upright bass. Yeah. This is Greg playing... Um, it kind of sounds more like a cello. I don't remember if we had a cello. I thought we just had an upright bass, but it could be a cello. So he's just doing some kind of cool effects in certain spots. Oh, yeah. And then I looped him bowing the, the tonic of the, the bass line there, which I think is uh, B, B flat, maybe. Yeah, remember that part and this part. Now we get into the first guitar track. Did I mention that uh, Failure likes to use very highly processed guitar sounds? Now, this was definitely spatialized somehow in the mix. A lot of times what I'll do is do the uh, split delay trick or, or whatever you want to call it. 
I will pull up a very simple um, Avid uh, stereo the delay, and I it, it comes up with a preset that I've already built here called 20 millisecond split. And what that is, is it turns the track into a stereo track. Now, I have the mix of the delay on the left turned to zero, so that's dry. And I have the mix on the right turned up 100%, 100% wet. And the delay for the right is set to 20 milliseconds. So here's the mono track. And here it is with this 20 millisecond split. Now, with this split, because the left is dry and it's happening, you know, before the 20 milliseconds, it actually appears more forward when you're listening. So the guitar is slightly, to me, feels slightly sh shifted to the left. So maybe we'll do the same thing with the second guitar, but switch the panning. Let's listen to the second guitar. Let's bypass this. This is kind of more like a, a crazy effect guitar. So let's turn on the spread. But let's switch the panning. sort of how I remember it. Okay, got everything in except uh, for vocals and this last track of synth pad. The thing that we did and most people did back then is like, you did a lot of processing as you uh, recorded. You didn't save things to the mix to add delay and reverb and whatever crazy effects you wanted to add. You just recorded it that way. Gonna do the old tr split trick just to kind of down and dirty it right now. Ourselves again. Just bump up the whole region here a little bit. Rip out that this, uh, pretty sure when we recorded this record, we used this actual mic for all the lead vocals. This has been around for a long time. This is called a Shure SM7. Uh, it's meant to be used really close up with heavy compression, so you just get a very even sound and uh it uses the proximity effect to make your voice sound kind of rich and boomy in the bass that's what we used on this record this actual one living now it sounds like a, a phantasm of the nerves it's very high mid there's almost no lows so probably did some pre-eq on it in Okay, but what's this last track? Well, it's a printed vocal effects track generated from this lead vocal track. Very low level, let's just bump it up here and see how that sounds.
that's a blend of the two together. And this is a very familiar sound to me from listening to the album mix for so many years. So there's a rough mix. It's not the album mix. There was a lot more going on there with um, effects, reverbs, delays, more compression. I know we weren't going to do any other processing, but let's just throw on a bus compressor and see what happens. It sounds like a police car. Right, so there you go, heliotropic. That's going to wrap it up for episode five. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Later.